Hi, I'm Fran Spielman. I'm with me is Paul Vallis, the mayoral challenger, used to be revenue director, used to be budget director, used to be CPS CEO, and a former candidate for governor, and uh, also for lieutenant governor. Paul, welcome. Thanks for having me. You came to this building last or earlier this week and talked about the pension bonds. The mayor is talking about the idea of a $10 billion borrowing to lessen the burden of post-election tax increases. Why, why are you so alarmed about this? Well, first of all, uh, you have to understand that what the mayor wants to do is to borrow more, uh, an amount greater than the entire city budget. And what he's essentially doing is he's saying, look, uh, we're going to issue these $10 billion in pension bonds. We're going to put the pension bonds uh, uh, in the, uh, the bond proceeds, in, in the pension funds, and, and we're going to hope that they will generate more in interest than we will have to pay on the bonds themselves. Now, you know, if you look at the uh, economic performance uh, over the last two decades, that can be a very, very dangerous uh, proposition, so to speak, because you run the risk that uh, if, if you, we hit another recession, or for that matter, uh, the market collapses, uh, like it did in 2008, um, uh, taxpayers are going to take a beating or they're going to have to come back and significantly uh, reduce city services. Let me also point out that the mayor is going to be uh, dedicating uh, uh, much of the remaining flexible revenues to guarantee these bonds. In other words, the, the, the bondholders are going to have first draw on those revenues before police As and they fire, already do on sales taxes. On so, on so many things because you have to understand they've all they've literally they're coming close to mortgaging the entire city's financial future. For example, right now the existing property tax, all but seven percent of the goes existing property pensions. tax goes to pensions and long term debt. Right. And as you know when they created the MAC so that they could have uh, uh, a a a better borrowing mechanism. You're talking about the sales tax the securitization. Sales tax. What they did was they secured those bonds. They secured that lending, uh, that lending instrument, with sales tax growth. Well, what are the what's left to secure? Uh, the city's share of the corporate personal property replacement tax or the state income tax. The bottom line is we are in effect privatizing our revenue sources. So, so the bondholders will have a draw on our revenues, and I just think it's an extraordinarily dangerous thing to do. You say that the mayor is trying to punt the decision of which taxes he intends to raise to meet the billion-dollar pension obligation that will come due after the election. And yet, where's your plan? Well, as you well know, I'm, I, I'm never short on details on any of my plans. If you look at what I've laid out, uh, on public safety. On, I've talked about how I'm going to strengthen the police department, how I'm going to increase their ranks and uh, rebuild their super, uh, super, uh, supervisory infrastructure and how I'm going to pay for it. And I will uh, uh, also present my plan in the coming weeks on how I will not only address the pension issue, but how I'll address the long-term financial needs of the city. And it will be, uh, it will offer uh, it will offer uh, the same level of details that I've offered You've on my public safety plan. You've been saying that, but you haven't come across with the plan. Well, because I mean, I'm give trying. Me a, give me a, a sense. You've criticized the mayor for hammering the middle right. class. You have criticized the system of fines and fees that hammer right. the middle class. What exactly would you do differently? Well, when I present my plan, you'll see it. And, and I'll present my plan shortly. I'll tell you what I won't do. Uh, I won't borrow $10 billion dollars and on, on some hope that somehow uh, investing that money in the pension funds is going to realize a return that will exceed what I'll be paying in debt obligation. You also have to understand that uh, with $10 billion in borrowing come anywhere from 2 to 4 percent uh, of that money, or f for that matter, they uh, the just the, the you're talking about the, the fees, the gravy fees, train of fees, the gravy train. I mean that will that will equal anywhere between two to four percent of that ten billion dollars. That's two hundred to four hundred million dollars. And 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 you won't see it up front. It will be buried into the borrowing and that money will go to you know, con financial consultants, bond Are you councils, saying it's et pay to play? Is that well, what it certainly creates the dynamic for pay to play. So I you think th that's the whole point? No, you know, I think what they're trying to do is the following. Uh, uh, he doesn't want to he, he doesn't want to be forthcoming on how he's going to address the city's financial problems going forward. And if you remember in his first term, he punted. 
He literally punted for four years, took no action on pensions, took no action to get the legislature to provide fair funding for the teachers' pension fund, which incidentally will cost taxpayers $1.5 billion. Uh, so, so once again, he's punting again because this will allow him to, to, uh, uh, to not address the funding issues in any sort of comprehensive way, to, to kind of punt the need for big tax increases. And at the same time, uh, you know, it, it will also give them the ability to, to uh, you know, to distribute a lot of bond business around. And that always creates a, a, a condition within which pay to play can thrive. Because imagine 200 to $400 million in business going to the financial consultants and to the How uh, much do you think he could raise off of that? Like that? Oh, I don't know. You can, I mean, there are some restrictions on what financial institutions can contribute. But at the end of the day, this is like the mother of all bond deals. And, and, and Blagojevich did this in 2003. I know a little something about that. He borrowed $10 billion, but this, the state budget, uh, by comparison, was about five times the size of, of the city's budget in, 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 terms of, uh, in terms of 2003 dollars. And, and, and how did that work out? Do you realize that, that now he borrowed in 2003. Do you realize we still have, and he borrowed 10 billion. Now think about this, and your listeners should think about this. We still have $13.6 billion to pay to retire that borrowing. It's been 14 years or 15 years since those bonds were issued, and we still owe $13.6 billion. So this is just, uh, it's, uh, I will tell you this, no, no sort of bonding scheme like this will be a part of my financial plan. Michael Sachs, you've referred to him as the financial Svengali. Is that <laughs> supposed to be some pejorative term? What do, you, what do you mean there? Well, look, you know, here you have Michael Sachs. Uh, uh, he's, uh, he's one of the mayors. Uh, um, he is the mayor's. He is the mayor's biggest donor. Biggest donor. Sachs people seem to go in and out of government. Many people who have left government have gone on to work for Sachs. Uh, now suddenly we have Sachs appear. Uh, 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 to present and, this? Uh, to present this and to talk about this and to defend it. Uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, what are you, know, you what are you saying? Get to the point. Well, my suggestion is, you know, Sachs doesn't live in the city. Uh, you know, are, is Sachs thinking about the best interests of the city, or is this about generating more business? And not necessarily for he him. He doesn't go for city business. Well, yeah, but do his friends go for city business, or do his do his clients go for city business? The bottom line is, I think this is just ill conceived, and and he has no official position with the city. Now, he has no... He's, a, he's the vice chairman of World Business Chicago. Oh, yes. And when was the last time they opened their books? World Business Chicago. When was the last time uh, anyone was able to get any money, I mean, any information about World Business Chicago, uh, about their travel, about their expenditures, etc.? cetera? Uh, you try to FOI World Business Support Chicago, you'll be waiting until hell freezes over to get that information. So, so it, it, it's just... I just think that there are, are people who are not elected who, who actually don't have any official appointed position other than World Business Chicago, uh, which some people consider to be, you know, you know, almost, you know, that, that the city hall or the mayor uses World Business Chicago to do things that he would not normally be able to do uh, uh, in a, you know, in a, uh, in a, uh, in a open and transparent way. And, and, and here you have somebody making a decision or rushing the city to borrow $10 billion. The city's budget's $9 billion. Now, the rideshare settlement, $10.4 million, the mayor's decided to spend on mentoring programs. Yeah, but let me point out here, here's an example. Well, but wait, yes. the, the, he, he skirted the idea that there were drivers on the street who perhaps endangered passengers. What do we need to do about that? Do we need fingerprinting? What do we need to do there? Well, first of all, I believe, and... And, 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 and about the ride-sharing companies. Yeah, you know, I, I saw the editorial in the Tribune the other day about the whole issue of capping, lift, and, you know, yeah. and, you know I don't think we should put it, any restrictions when it comes to uh, the, the number of Lyft drivers or the number of uh, uh, Uber drivers. Uh, I think, though, that, that every, three things need to be done. One is there need to be background checks. I mean, look. There know, are background checks. Do we need fingerprinting? Do uh, we need criminal? Well, I believe fingerprinting should be a part of it. For all? For anyone driving. So anyone driving. Anyone. Uh, anyone driving. There, there needs to be ba those type of background checks. Or at the very least, they need to go back and they need to look at their records. And so they need Well, that to they've done. But I'm saying, is this an episode, 
uh, evidence for fingerprinting? I think you need the same type of background checks that you have with the cabbies, and I think that would involve fingerprinting. Secondly, I think the cars need to be inspected. We need to make sure that the cars that they are driving are cars that, uh, that are, are safe. And then the third thing uh, is I think that the apps, that the, the cabs, the existing cab operators, should have the opportunity to use the apps too they, so that they, they can. Okay. There, there are some restrictions on that and there are prohibitions because I've talked to many of the cab operators who, who, who incidentally do not support any, cap, any caps on Lyft or Uber but would like to be able to participate in the apps too. So I think those three things would go a long way towards bringing accountability and leveling the playing field while not upsetting the market. After the weekend, the horrible weekend of 12 murders, 71 shootings, still no arrests. Why? Why? Because we don't have enough detectives. And, and, and let me tell you what happened. Uh, what happened wa when, when the mayor elected not to fill all those police vacancies. He, he, allowed, uh, he allowed positions to attrit, so our detectives division went from 1,200 to less than 700. Now he's now rapidly trying to restore the 1,200 detectives, but the detectives uh, division is, first of all, even when we were at 12,000, uh, 1,200, we had percentage-wise, as a percent of our overall police strength, we had half the number of detectives that New York and, and L.A. have. And, and, and even as they re rebuild the detectives division, the detectives division probably has the least experience than it's ever had in our history. So we simply don't have the manpower and, and, and the experience to go out there and to complete these cases. And, and the detectives will tell you they refer to it as assembly line detective work because what happens is they have a case and they're overwhelmed with so many cases that when they have a case and they don't have enough evidence to, to move that case forward and they suddenly get another case because they're adding one investigatory uh, assignment to another, they drop what they're doing and they pick up the new case. You've so talked about getting people to cooperate with a citywide witness protection program. Talk about that a little bit. Well, what well, is that? Well, let me just say Why do one we thing. need it? There is no reason why we can't go out and we can't bring back retired police officers with investigatory experience so that we can significantly increase the number of detectives that we have available, individuals who know the neighborhood, who have deep experience, uh, and, 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 and we can immediately have an impact in increasing the clearance rates on murders from 17 percent to where they are in New York and LA and other cities 60, 70, 80 uh, percent. We also need a witness protection program a and this isn't something I just came up with. This is something that detectives on the beat, detectives tell me that they need because how are people going to come forward if you can't protect them? You know we all talk about oh well the community, the community knows who these shooters are, the community knows who, who the killers are, the community knows uh, the, the dangerous criminals, but the community needs to come for it. Well, if you're only clearing 5% of the shootings and you're only clearing 17% of the murders, and if there's no way to protect these individuals, or, or at least there's the perception that you can't protect the people, people are not going to come for it. So we need to, uh, look, <laughs> I'll stop talking about retired detectives if they, if they hire retired detectives. I'll be more than happy to shut up. But it, how would the witness protection program work? Well, what would you give people? Where would you put them? Sometimes it's as simple as giving them housing vouchers and relocating them elsewhere in the city. The Texas have told me sometimes it's that simple. There are individual detectives who have attempted to help witnesses on their own get relocated. They're not talking about getting relocated under assumed names in Arizona. You know, sometimes it's something that simple. And if you go to my website, one of the one of Would my Would that be enough to help you to convince someone to co to turn a murderer in? Well, there are other cities that have comprehensive witness protection programs, and I think there's varying degrees of those programs. I just think that we need to be able to uh, when need be uh, when the detectives determine that this, uh, this uh, witness needs protection, we need to have the capacity and we need to have the resources in order to move them to a safe and secure place. And would and you give them a stipend as well as a housing well, voucher? Well, you, know, you know, I think I've articulated it in, in, my, uh, in my memo that I attached to my public safety initiative the, ver the, different, you know, the different types of uh, protective measures you could take. So it, it really depends on the circumstance and it also depends on the nature of the case. Um, okay, so uh, let me ask you this. Yeah. Uh, you've talked about a partnership with the FOP mm -hmm. to develop a long-term financial plan. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, and, and, and resources to sustain. Every single time, every single time I, I have been a, a school superintendent, 
uh, or for that matter, when I was worked for the city, I, I brought the unions in and I established a relationship with them. And I call it, I call it extended strategic bargaining. And you have to cover me on this. So what I would, would do, and, and when I was uh, uh, budget director, I would meet monthly with the, with, uh, with the Federation of Police, Nolan. Okay, but and I'm then, asking no. you this so, question. What do you right, mean so the question by, is what, what is the plan that you're going to work on? What happens is when you bring, when you make uh, the police union representatives a full partner and you, and you engage them and you interact with them and you don't surprise them and you listen to them and you try to be responsive to them, I find that they become very accommodating. Because when what they What can they help you come up with? Well, you know, like what? I, you know, if you laid out a five-year plan, a five-year uh, financial plan, and it included a plan to strengthen the police department and to do all the things, all the things that I articulated, I believe, I believe that, that, that if they saw what the vision was, if they saw uh, you know, that this was a plan to put enough police officers on the street, to, uh, you know, you know, to bring some accountability to the promotion process, you know what I mean, to reform merit promotions, to have enough sergeants, to have enough uh, 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 police training officers and to compensate those training officers so that, they, so that the best cops want to be training officers, uh, to provide the continuous training. Uh, if they saw what you were trying to accomplish, I think they would be more accommodating. So if you needed to do things to bring about greater cost efficiency, uh, efficiency uh, and to, you know, and to 